Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 490th New Social Environment. I'm Ty, the Senior Production Assistant here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Jack Shear, Arlene Chaquette, Jared Ernest, Claire Gilman, Helen Lee, and Joaquin Pissarro. We are thrilled to welcome poet Steve Levine here, who will read to close today's program. A few quick notes before we get started. The Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on the Nape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenape Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you all to check the chat in just a moment for a living document of resources and actions. And now to introduce today's guests and hosts, photographer, curator, and art collector, Jack Shear is president of the Ellsworth Kelly Foundation and serves on the Drawings and Prints Committee at the Museum of Modern Art. Most recently, his drawings were on view at the Blanton Museum of Art in Austin, Texas, and his own photographs are in the collections of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney Museum of American Art. Artist and curator Arlene Shekhet has designed and curated exhibitions, including Porcelain, No Simple Matter, Arlene Shekhet and the, Ar and the Arnold Collection at the Frick Collection, and From Here On Now at the Phillips Collection. She currently has work on view at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Jewish Museum, and the Museum of Arts and Design. Writer and curator Jarrett Ernest has contributed to publications including What It Means to Write About Art, Interviews with Art Critics from David Zwerner Books, The Brooklyn Rail, and Art in America. He has recently curated exhibitions including The Young and the Evil at David Zwerner and Closer as Love, Polaroid 1993 to 2007, Briar Peorage at, at Nina Johnson. Claire Gilman is chief curator at the Drawing Center in New York and holds a PhD from Columbia University. She has written for art journals, CAA reviews, documents, freeze, October, and her book Drawing in the Present Tense, co-authored with Roger Malbert, is forthcoming from Thames and Hudson. Collector, academic, art advisor, art book editor, and auction house specialist Helen Lee has worked at Christie's, Harry Ann Abrams Publishing, the Robert Miller Gallery, and for James Wolfenson, among others. Helen is an advisor to the Milken Institute, is the chairman of the American Foundation for the Courtauld Institute of Art, and is a board member of the RAIL. And finally, art historian Joaquin Bissaro is the Burchard Professor of Art History and director of the Hunter College Galleries, Hunter College, and was a curator at MoMA's Department of Painting and Sculpture. His latest books, book Aesthetics of the Margins, The Margins of Aesthetics, Wild Art Explained from Penn State is co-authored with David Carrier. Joachim is a consulting editor of The Rail. Today's conversation on the exhibition Ways of Seeing, three takes on the Jack Shear Drawing Collection is on view at the Drawing Center through February 20th. Please take us away, Helen. Thank you so much, Ty, for introducing all of us and getting us prepared for what feels a little bit to me like a party. It's definitely a celebration about the joy and pleasure of seeing. So um, before we talk about the show and have a little bit of an overview, I just wanted to say that while we were putting together the slideshow, I got a little glimpse of some of what must be uh, a little bit of the complexities of putting together such a beautiful and detailed show. And um, I wanted to ask everyone who is listening and uh, watching today that if you have uh, seen the show in any of the iterations and want to share what you uh, found one of the most interesting relationships or pieces in the show, to please let us know in the chat and um, share some of your thoughts about the show because there is just so much to go into. I'm sure we're not going to be able to give it that as much detail as uh, we, we're all hoping that we will be. Um, I just want to also remind everybody that we're going to be seeing slides of the show or images of the show, which is not nearly the same as being able to commune with them in the flesh. So um, just starting with the concept behind the show, Claire, I just wanted to ask you how the idea came about um, talk a little bit about the relationships maybe between um, amongst the curators. I wanted to have my copy of John Berger's Way of Seeing, one of the most seminal works of my academic career. 
um, but I couldn't get my hands on it. I know it was published 50 years ago, but um, maybe you can tell us more about all of that. Um, yes, of course. Thank you, Helen. And thank you so much to The Rail uh, for inviting us here uh, to talk about this show. Uh, it's wonderful to be here today. So um, yeah, so I can talk a little bit about uh, the, how the show came about. Um, I, I think it was almost three years ago now. I've, I've, I've lost a bit track of time, but uh, that I went upstate to Spencertown oh. to uh, look at uh, Jack's drawing collection, um, which is installed in uh, Ellsworth Kelly's uh, studio in that uh, studio complex. And um, I think what struck me, in addition to the fact that just this was an absolutely incredible uh, collection of drawings, was the way that Jack installed them. So uh, there were drawings basically kind of sitting on top of each other, uh, drawings nestled in corners, drawings directly abutting each other, um, and arranged not according to any idea of chronology or kind of you know relationships between subject matter um, or uh, any sort of um, you know the overarching themes, but really according to Jack's own, I think, um, intuition and his own feeling, um, his own sort of personal sense of the relationship between things. Um, and in that moment, I thought, well, first we need to show this uh, collection at the drawing center, but also uh, wouldn't it be cool to invite, you know, two other people perhaps to, curate shows from that same collection to really highlight and kind of play up this idea of um, the personal relationships that, that Jack was pointing to in his installation. Um, so hence came this idea of a kind of three-part show. And then when I was thinking about who to invite to do this, I wanted people who had done some curating, um, but maybe who weren't sort of primarily or, or exclusively known as curators, um, and kind of who came from different walks of life to bring that perspective. So I thought of Arlene Sheckett, who is uh, an incredible sculptor. Um, who has also done curating. You heard about her projects at the Frick, I think in the bio uh, Phillips collection. She also has one upcoming at the Harvard Art Museums. And I thought it would be really interesting to bring the perspective of someone who typically works in, in three dimensions, although Arlene also does work in two dimensions in how she communicates drawings. And then I thought of Jarrett, who I just think is a really fabulous curator and um, who I thought would have a lot of fun uh, with, with these works, which I think he did. And in fact, both of them also, I should mention Arlene and Jarrett, both have an interest in a kind of wide uh, historical period, you know, interested both in the contemporary moment and going way back. Uh, in time, which is what Jack's collection does. So I thought they would be great people to bring to the project. And then somewhere along the way, um, this idea of having, uh, of John Berger came into view. And actually, uh, he wasn't necessarily in my mind at the beginning. It was as I was thinking through, you know, what I was trying to say with this show or why I was bringing these people to the table that I thought, you know, this is what it is about. It is about how John Berger talked about art, which was to point out the fact that, you know, works of art really um, kind of change uh, depending on the way in which they are seen and received, um, you know, who is bringing them into view and the context in which they're being brought into view and the other works that they're seen alongside. Um, and so we ended up uh, deciding to, Jack, I think his collection has 1,000 drawings now, but we decided to hone things down to a smaller pool of drawings, about two, 250 drawings, I think, ultimately, um, so that the curators would each be choosing from that pool of drawings. And really that was the only stipulation. Otherwise they had complete freedom to do what they wanted. But the idea being that there would probably um, come about some overlaps if we were starting with such a, you know, with a, with a reduced pool of drawings, although that wasn't a requirement. Um, and so, you know, that I think was part of the, the joy of seeing all three iterations, both to see um, the very different ways in which the curators approach the collection, but also to see some of the same drawings uh, in very different, different lights and to, to experience them hopefully in new ways, um, you know, bringing out that idea of John Berger's. I 
I thought it was really interesting, Claire, that you brought in the idea or that John Berger came to mind because he was this multidisciplinary um, art historian, novelist, critic, painter, poet, and all three of the curators of the show have more than one discipline um, to bring this show to life. And yet they have very distinct perspectives too. So I thought that was a very sort of um, interesting parallel um, and something that uh, was inspiring to me when I looked through the show um, in its multiple iterations. Um, so before we go start and look, looking at the uh, various takes one by one and starting with Jack, I just wanted to uh, point out that this is a collection that ranges from the 16th century to the 21st century. Is that right, Jack? Correct. And uh, the number of pieces in your collection keeps going up every time I hear about it. It's about a thousand pieces um, and counting. And um, I think it's really extraordinary to look at, um, well, we all love you and I certainly am always so excited to see you, but now getting a little, uh, getting acquainted with your collection, I know why. Um, it's, uh, it's, it sort of breaks museological convention. Um, it reveals unexpected relationships and um, this, the three takes really, you know, show how you think and how you react as a collector. Um, but so let's talk, let's talk about your iteration, but I also wanted to point out that you're also an artist yourself. So maybe you can bring that in when you talk about how you look at your works that you, um, that you've shown in this particular form version of the show. Okay, should, should I start now? Is that, you, go, go ahead. Uh, so um, first of all, I just have to, I don't actually know how to do this and maybe it's not the right thing to do, but uh, I want to thank Roberta Smith for her amazing insights into the, um, the, the three iterations um, of, 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 of the uh, ways of seeing. Uh, it was insightful, it was, um, I found almost everything that she said, I, I, I just agreed with. I mean, she really was very perceptive and I just wanna publicly thank her for that great uh, review. I don't know if you can do that for critics or not, but. I, of course you can. And I think we can maybe put it a link to it in the chat. I read it too, and it was really inspiring. And she talks about how uh, drawing uh, the act of it and the works uh, as drawings themselves are just revelatory and so important. And um, I think it's a great way to begin, Jack. I actually, I love the, the, the line, maybe I'm paraphrasing it, but uh, she basically said, collectors who don't collect drawings shouldn't be called collectors. Um, and I sort of agree with that on some kind of level. Uh, I don't know what that means. Um, first of all, the accessibility of drawing is amazing. It's, it's uh, uh, artists, it's the quickest thing from the mind to the hand. Uh, it's, it's, it's very experimental, but it can be very finished. Um, the drawings that I have tended to collect are literally just personal favorites, uh, things that I, I see and I respond to. <laughs> um, and uh, if you look at you know, this slide that's up right now, Oh, well, maybe not that slide, but that slide. There's a David Hockney drawing right there and it's called Man Drawing. And it's basically probably a portrait of Hockney standing in front of a large blank piece of paper or a wall and he's making various marks on it. Um, I found it interesting that each of us, each of the three iterations, Arlene and Jared and I, both had one drawing that was connected to this, this uh, text that we had at the beginning of the show. And it sort of is a pendant piece for the show. And I think it's, it really says something about each of us in a, in a really specific way. Um, I mean, Jar Jared's was uh, spiritual and intellectual. 
Uh, Arlene's was amazing and 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 and, and sculptural, uh, and um, you know I, I like I like the Hockney drawing. Um, so go to the next slide. Uh, this is how I install, uh, which is probably unorthodox. That's me on the left, uh, holding up um, a uh, Aaron Morris uh, watercolor. Uh, so what I tend to do is um, have a group of people just hold up artworks, these, these drawings, and I create these, these vignettes or these constellations or, or, or sentences with each of the groups of, of um, drawings that I'm installing. Uh, it, 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 it creates some kind of incredible uh, dynamic between the two. Um, you know, uh, putting the Rashid Johnson, which is the red drawing, uh, with with a Twombly. Uh, so this was going to be the finished wall, and then at some point I put uh, Julie Maratu up above the uh, uh, Warhol and into the um, Twombly, and it became there. It is, and it became this incredible uh, dynamic kind of relationship between. Um, the the uh, Charles Demuth on the on the bottom, this watercolor that's beautiful. I mean, it's it's just it's it, he's, you know. I mean, people who aren't you know who know something about art um, basically have said that they thought it was a Cezanne, you know, drawing. And I go, no, this is an American who is awesome. Putting it next to the uh, Warhol creates sort of a veritas for you know a moramente. Um, memento, memento. I don't know. How do you say it? Well, uh, how do you? Who, somebody tell me. How do you say that? Um, memento mori. Is that what, what? Memento mori. Yeah, what? memento mori. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, and then on this other wall, this was the the opening to my. You know, this kind of wall. I think for each one of us, this this wall, like across from the text as you enter, was sort of an important wall for each of us. Um, and um, what was I going to say? I did look at the ways of, uh, of seeing the John Berger recently. And chapter six basically has no words in it whatsoever. It just is a series of images, both contemporary and, 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 and not contemporary. Um, uh, photographs out of, out of, out of magazines. Uh, it's 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 pretty uh, amazing uh, that I hadn't realized that. I mean, I hadn't realized that it had been in that form. And basically, that's hopefully what I'm doing is putting disparate kind of drawings together that tell a story or or tell a story to me. It, it doesn't it doesn't even have to be a story that's recognizable. It can just be about um, it can just be about collage. Uh, when I got to the space, I didn't know what I was going to hang. I knew that I had 250 drawings to choose from. Uh, I chose about 130 to put up in the uh, installation. Um, let's see. I, I started with a wall of male images on one side and female images on the other, which this space is a very large space. And I wanted something to, to really be sort of have this gravity uh, on both sides. The, the, the uh, female section is hung with the tops of all of the frames uh, abutting and creating this line across the top. And the male uh, images are, are like on a shelf. They're all hung as if they're on a shelf. And um, I, I just had so much fun with it. I, I just, I, it, to me, the highest form of life is play. And when both Jared and, and um, Arlene and Claire, I said, this is about play. I mean, this is about, don't, don't just, just put something up. Don't worry about it. Just create something, create something with the materials that you have in front of you, these, these incredible drawings. And I think everyone did that. Everyone, I think, played. Uh, I think it's really important to play in life. Um, 
And uh, uh, I should say something about the frames. Uh, I tend not to take any of the drawings out of frames that they have lived in. Um, so this is uh, an Evelyn de Morgan that you see up here, which is a, a she is one of the, she's not a pre-Raphaelite, but I, I sort of think of her as like the sisterhood of the pre-Raphaelites. And uh, she comes after the pre-Raphaelites and knew most of them. But her work is amazing. Um, I, I have three drawings in my collection. Uh, but when I saw this, this came up recently at auction in London, I just, I couldn't believe how beautiful it was and how special it was. So here's a case, this is a pre-Raphaelite frame. There's no way I'm going to take that drawing out of that frame um, unless there's a problem with it, unless it's, there's some kind of uh, problem with conservation. Um, that's the only time, uh, if, it's, if it's detrimental to the drawing, uh, I will change the, the frame out. But other than that, I, I sort of like the idea that this is the home of the drawing and it should be kept in their home. They shouldn't get a new home just because I think everything should be equal or everything, you know, I like, so the way I collect is exactly like the way the, 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 the frames are. It's, it's like, I, there are things that I really like and things that I don't like. Um, in fact, I think on the last, I think I got some, some, some slack for saying that there are actually artists in my collection who I don't like, um, or I, I like, let me, let me rephrase that, sorry. I like them as artists. I don't, I appreciate the drawing and the drawing that I bought of theirs is probably the best drawing that I, that I think is one of their best drawings that they have produced. Um, and, but I just don't understand them. So sometimes I do like to buy works that I have trouble with, that I know the quality is very, very high, but I'm not exactly sure. And I wanna live with it. I want, I wanna see why I don't like it. Why, why do people respond to it? And why do I not respond to it in that, on that way? Uh, so it, it's, it's sort of challenging in some ways. It's just not everything in my collection is uh, a masterpiece by any means. Uh, and, and it's really idiosyncratic. Um, and uh, it's sort of like my life, so. Uh, Jack, I just love the way your collection works and the way you go about finding things. And I think the statement you were referring to was, I think um, you said something about even drawings that you own um, that you may not end up loving or have be one of your favorites. There's always a lesson to be learned. Does that make sense? That yeah, that told, that's exactly, there's a lesson for me anyway. I think I feel like what really impresses us though is just your the amazing insight that you have about each and every work that you have they're all individual they're all um special and you just know um that they're great for whatever reason you just in instinctively know and I think um I read a story about the very first piece you bought um as a young man and I thought that was very telling because if you, if you don't mind letting us know which that piece was and how you ended up getting it and where it ended up, you know, why you decided to take it. Well, there, there, are, there are a few things. Uh, I, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley uh, and I'm not sure if you're referring to the daguerreotype that I bought. Oh, well, I didn't know about the daguerreotype. Okay. That's so there, there's, so there's, there, there is a, actually another, uh, there is another story. Which is uh, so I used to ride my bike all over the San Fernando Valley, and I uh, went to I used to go to antique shops, and I loved old things, and I was a collector from the time I can remember, and I collected bottle caps, and I collected rocks, and I collected doorknobs, and um, I just you know growing up in Los Angeles, you don't really have a sense of history, uh, so I, I was really. I, I was really thirsty for that. Uh, I, I, uh, I, went into a, I went into a shop and there was a Japanese wood block uh, and uh, I saw it uh, and uh, uh, I'm thinking uh, I might get this wrong, but I think the artist is a, basically the end of the 20th century, uh, end of the 19th century, first part of the 21st century. I think he lived uh, through 
uh, probably the 20s or 30s, and I think it's Kawasaki. And he did this incredible Zoji temple in, 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 um, in the snow. And it's a beautiful woodblock. And I, I saw it in this shop and I think it was $60. And I went in and I loved it. And I went back and I put down $20 on it. And I said, can I pay this over time? And the, the guy was very nice. I'm 15 years old. I mean, like, you know, of course, what's he gonna do, right? And um, I put the, the uh, $20 down and I didn't go back. And like I either I didn't have the money or, I, you know, whatever. And I went to the at that time it was the Pasadena Museum of Art. Uh, and I went and they had picked this image for their Christmas card that year. And I went, oh, my God, I have to go back and pick up that <laughs> that print. Uh, and I rode my bike and I put it on the back of my bike and rode it home and and um, and I I, uh, I love it. I still have it. Ah, that's such a good story. And I'm just so impressed that at age 15 that you had those instincts, in, you know, from the get go. So it, I think it's telling when you see the works that um, this is from a, a deeper place than just any sort of reading a book about an artist or seeing one show. It's something that comes from sort of a deeper place that um, of, of knowing what you what interests you and and knowing a little bit about uh, what excites you. I, I think what, what's nice is each of these shows reveal the character of each of these iterations reveal the character of, of both myself and Arlene and Jared and I think in a really specific way um, how, how you, you approach seeing uh, you know, they're like building blocks or they're, you know, and, and, and how different people put together, uh, uh, you know, I mean, this could go on for years. I mean, we could literally do this for the next, you know, year and have, you know, like 10 iterations and it would be awesome. Well, I think that's a perfect segue so that we don't uh, stretch the Zoom for too much longer than... Okay, sorry, did I talk too long? No, no, you are perfect. You're absolutely... Okay. Perfect, Jack. And I hope we'll be get you back in the conversation, but let's try to get Arlene and Jared in the conversation too. All right. Just chronologically, let's move on to the next iteration, which was Arlene's beautiful iteration take on uh, your collection, Jack. And we see the wide install shot here. And I think it's a beautiful picture image because we have Arlene's beautiful sculptural benches with the architecture fitting in so well with the drawing center exhibition space. Arlene, do you wanna talk about the painted walls and, and your beautiful benches and how that all fits together in your look at your take, your iteration? Yeah, sure, thank you. Can you hear me? Um, so first of all, it was nice uh, have, it's always great having Jack go first because we can all experience his sense of liberation. Uh, and um, that, I think, really set the tone for, for all of us. His liberation, he, he's a liberated collector. So that kind of openness um, and being set free uh, gave, I believe, all three of us um, a lot of permission. And so the interest for me was having this wide open collection going, as you said, from the 16th century to the present is such a, it's such a rare opportunity to play with things from such a wide, uh, broad period of time. Um, when I, I realized that um, the show that I put up had a lot to do with the time period in which it was conceived um, and also the space within which it, it, it was hung. And so the first thing that was going on is been, was the pandemic ongoing. Uh, and I re and so when I went to see this show, what, uh, when I went to see the collection at Jack's, one of the things that I 
knew I had to do was narrow down what I would show because otherwise there would be 500 drawings in the show. So how would I narrow it? I, I would narrow it um, finally by taking, focusing on the sense of touch or the act of touching, which in, you know, a, a year or two ago and still like that was a verboten thing. You know, we, we, we were not allowed to have um, intimate contact. It was in question. So um, that kind of closeness, that kind of intimacy, uh, subconsciously weighed on me and I decided to, uh, to make that as a way I would choose the drawings, uh, a, 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 an envelope for um, the intellectual discourse. And, um, and then from the point of view of the visuals, there I um, set my mind to the Mirandi, which maybe we had had the uh, image of, but the Mirandi drawing, um, and I'm a huge fan of Mirandi in general, had this had has this um, horizon line uh, and a uh, and also a very much a grounding of objects within the a, a, a tight space, so much so that things, um, all those individual vases in his latest, uh, last paintings become one form. Uh, and that idea of becoming one is something that he was very interested in. And the idea of space was something that compelled him. And so that, that spoke to me. I, hand painted the walls, so I wanted to ground the space. I think the other night I was talking about how sometimes I feel like the art world is very hung up on being cool. Uh, and so I wanted and to make this place warm. <laughs> And I was also thinking of the time period, it would be November, it would that I was hanging, I, I, I was addressing time and space. And in the space when I walked in, I, the, the pillars which are centered on the space, uh, create a lot of a, like little toothpicks in comparison to the large volume. And so I wanted to bring the walls in and use the idea of horizontal sculptures that could also function as places for people to linger, to gather, and to be with the drawings. Because of course, drawings are absolutely something, uh, a form of art that take a while to um, digest, especially in this kind of uh, numbers and that they um, provided the center for me for, for being able to make a space that felt communal but respectful to the works. So that's why I didn't wanna put vertical sculptures. I wanted to make these horizontal sculptures and I wanted to use wood because wood is, Earthbound, this material is warm, earthbound. You can see I painted the walls using Mirandi's palette to a certain extent to create the landscape within which I felt I could, that it became, a, those be, lines became markers and then the benches reiterated that. And I knew when I started to carve the benches that as they would, does a thing called checking, which is essentially opening up of the grain. And those lines, which we can see very well here are to me drawings. They're, they may be drawings in, um, in three dimensions, but I had this sense of how again, we tend to separate things and that Jack's collection is about pulling things together and that I wanted my installation to be about pulling things together. So having the lines and the benches 
be in relationship to the drawings on the wall felt essential. And the benches themselves were gigantic lines. So um, in terms of uh, how I hung it, I, I, Jack had his way of standing with a bunch of people and the way I did it was very much the way I make sculpture, which is put down anchors. Um, so I think we can probably see the, the next image, um, but I would put an, some, some, uh, some image on the wall that I knew I wanted to have, uh, but I didn't know how it, it would be hung with everything else. I think there's a picture of an Ang, Ang work, um, one of four that Jack owns that is flanked by two women, portraits of uh, women that yeah. I think. But let's look at this for one second. This in the back room at the last minute and everything I, I also felt in the spirit of what Jack was doing and which is very much in the spirit of the way I make work, um, which is to be very present and not make things that are overly determined. So I am committed in my own work to being present with what is happening. And in the installation, I wanted that um, to, I wanted that the viewer could feel that it was idiosyncratic in the way that something is composed, a drawing is composed. So why are those, why is the spacing, um, different uh, between each of these. I, there's not a, an intellectual uh, explanation, but it is a, I hope, a sensitive uh, response to what is happening in the room as a whole. So I was always dealing with the room as a whole rather than, I mean, of course I had constellations, but I, really was trying to make the room work in this particular image. And in the back, I came upon the idea of, of uh, I wanted it to be that we are close with these people um, because Jack's collection also is quite figurative. And I wanted to make use of the figurative nature of his collection. And so all of these drawings are hung at eye height. I did not, in think of that before, but once it happened, I felt like, oh yeah, the, how, you know, of course that, that, that makes sense. So I think logic isn't necessarily something um, that needs to be figured, prefigured. It can happen in real time. So that, uh, so I would put down anchors and then dance with them and tried to make something that had an overall rhythm um, and make a kind of music of, of, the, of the rooms. Um, so we can keep going here. Uh, here's the Ang. I just thought it was so playful, Arlene. There were so many moments during your iteration, your take that I thought were just so fun. And I could almost imagine you um, having fun with it and chuckling to yourself a little bit. Not, not just chuckling to myself, laughing out loud. It was, it was, it was, uh, it was a complete, I love doing installation. I love installing and, uh, I, this particular moment, but so many other moments, uh, I mean, the whole thing was, was fun. Once I finally got in the room in order and hung, and I should say that was in two days because we were very cramped in the schedule. So, um, this Ang, this very contrite guy, um, being flanked by the Lachaise and the George Gross, uh, both voluptuous women and he very dressed uh, and very proper or very, um, uh, uh, well, contrite is probably the right word. Anyway, uh, brings that notion of humor and intellect 
functioning along with touch um, and rhythm, everything that I was trying to do. Uh, so, I like your idea of composition too, because they did feel, it did feel like there was some sequencing or that there was a yeah. chain they worked um, together in some way, or I was imagining maybe in my own head how they might uh, work together one by one. So I thought that this was an interesting moment. And also the distance, the spacing that you used both vertically and horizontally, yeah. it just spoke a lot about your practice and your work as a sculptor, just in the space in general and in amongst the relationship with the works themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I again, I, I was looking for something musical, um, something that had rhythm and also um, a circularity so that it was about the circulation and the overlapping of the images in a nonlinear way in a, um, a and this isn't this is a more more of a linear uh, shot, but there's a lot of moments that are nonlinear um, and that are more circular. Uh, so, you know, it like in a in a grouping like this, um, uh, this great Simeon drawing, which both Jared and I use, and then Edward Byrne Jones, you know, all all, the, all these great things looking to one another, all these images looking to one another, facing off, but not in such a direct way, like the uh, the Turup and the Menzel on the lower right um, are pairing, you know, in a real, I mean, I, I did find it incredibly, these two, when I found that pair, I, I, I did click my heels. Um, but just the just the relationships, these these relationships um, of one thing to the to the next, and there you have the hand, which is in maybe the signifier. This back wall was possibly the signifier for the what I was doing. Um, the 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 lang the language that follows through the the entire um, installation. So, well, um, I wonder if this might be a good time to bring Jared in because you mentioned the Burne Jones and the Salomon Simeon, and um, I think Jared, you use those works as well in your last and current version of the of the show. Um, which I think is the most restrained, but very, very beautiful and soft and just um, equally surprising and pleasurable. Um, and I love the black, the back room with the colors and the Gladys Nilsson. Um, so can you take us through a little bit of a tour of, of your show? Well, I could try. Um, I think that I would say it's funny that you described it as restrained, especially considering you were just discussing with Arlene the use of the Ang drawing in a particular playful way or quote unquote playful way. Let me clarify that. By that, I mean, there was a lot of black and white works except for the back room. I think the front room was what I was referring to by saying that it was restrained. No, I don't think that you're wrong, but I think that, you know, what I was, what I was trying to say was that when you get, when you look at an artist like Ang, who I included four, no, three of them in the show, I think. Uh, yeah, three of them. Is that uh, one of the things that's fascinating to me about him is there's this anecdote that I remember reading in a piece by Thomas Hess uh, in Art News very early on in the 60s, maybe it was the late 50s actually. And there's a moment where like Ang like institutionally um, rises to a certain level of like um, political power as an artist that's like unprecedented. And then there, he writes in a letter to his friend, I'm going to spend the rest of my life destroying my stupid and petty little enemies. And I just think that that's so funny. Like, I think that that is so funny, the vehemence of it and the kind of cold severity of, his drawings, his particular style, which is one of the most 
ruthless and um, astonishing inventions in, in the scope of, of art history. So I think that after having seen, and I actually don't feel led to give like a blow by blow of my show, first of all, because I think it's very boring, people should go see it, it's self-evident. And also because I think that Arlene and Jack have done such a good job of kind of setting up the parameters that um, now someone after having experienced at length uh, Jack's decisions and Arlene's decisions and gotten the visual landscape of it, I saw both of those shows and I felt like it was incumbent upon me to do something that was as different from the two of them as possible, that that was part of the scope of the show the, or, or of the invitation, right? It's like do something that is somehow idiosyncratic that reflects a point of view and also that like gives people something different to look at than what they've seen before. And um, in that sense, because I, I, um, I only like doing things that as like a way of thinking about them. Like I don't have like an idea in advance of doing the show that I could just like do as a spiel. And um, I don't think any of us did. That's kind of what was the pleasure. And so um, I don't like talking about it like now in those terms. So in fact, I would really be interested in hearing questions from you or from the audience or something that could kind of get us into, you know, a dialogic space rather than a kind of like, you know, soliloquy. That's, that's a great, I like a great idea. And maybe I could just, I should have started that way um, by asking you what was some of your, your surprising revelations from doing the show? Um, you've all had curatorial experiences before. Was there anything that you was, was uh, different or, or surprising about this particular project. If you could go back to the previous slide, um, the person who's in charge of the slides, perfect. So um, I really liked, I actually hadn't thought about it before until Jack was speaking this afternoon about this wall as being like an important, almost like thesis statement within like the logic of each of our shows. And I actually think just comparing and contrasting the works that we put in this corner, which is immediately to the right when you enter into the gallery would be interesting. Um, one of the things that you can't see is immediately off the left, off the right hand side of the image is like a little um, thermostat that looks visually, um, interesting in relationship to the Bryce Marden. And I think that that kind of encapsulates, especially when you've painted, I've painted the wall like a dark gray. So it's like really intense. Otherwise it just fades away and it's not a big deal. Like I never, I don't remember in, in either Jack or Arlene shows thinking like, wow, that's really a, a temperature control device on the wall next to that painting or that drawing. But whenever we painted the walls black, I got really interested in it. And I got really interested in putting this kind of astonishingly pure artifact of, of the Marden drawing, which is so unimpeachable and just gorgeous in its severity, and then letting it live in the real world, like next to a, like an object, which is, which bears some kind of visual impact on your reading of it, whether you ideally would like it to or not, just like the wall, just like the exit sign, just like the, um, the power plugs. I mean, I don't know if anyone's seen the Charles Ray exhibition at the Met, but I came away being like, wow, there's a lot of sockets in those walls. You know, what I mean? it's like, is that part of the art? And in a certain way, it can't not be not part of the art. It's it's like, it's something that you experience. And when you open the doors to experience, you need to attend to what is there. So, and that's kind of part of the opportunity I think that we each took with this show. So going from the Martin drawing, I put right next to it, a little Mark Toby, and then right next to that, a little um, Gerhard Richter. And purely because I'm antagonistic to the, uh, the art thinking that preceded me, I'm kind of not anti Gerhard Richter, but I'm anti the claims that were made for Richter at a certain moment and how dominant they became around the theorization of postmodern art practice. So when you actually put a, that little um, kind of swooshy um, Richter, like, next to a, a Gerhard, uh, next to a, a Cy Twombly and on the other side, which you can't, not a Cy Twombly, next to a Mark Toby and on the other side, next to a Rauschenberg, it completely deflates it. It's like, 
okay, like, what is this? Is this interesting at all? And so I think that that's kind of the similar move to the, to the question that's posed by putting the Martin next to the thermostat. And I think across, throughout this show, I did a number of things like that because I wanted to learn from them. And I wanted to think about like what happens then and like what do other people think? So that's my answer to your question, Helen. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to that, that I think one of the things that I found um, just so wonderful about working on the show with the three of you, um, and you know, I don't know if it was an inevitable that it was going to emerge this way, but it goes back to what you were talking about the other night, Jarrett, um, you know, about how too often it's it's sort of like we're, we're you know, an, an exhibition happens and it's like this voice of God that's, you know, presenting the information and we, we don't know who's presenting it and there's every effort made to act as if no one specific is presenting it, right, or that there, there's no kind of personality behind it and that these objects are, yes, they have history, but they're sort of neutral in the moment that we're looking at them and in the space in which we're looking at them. But what was so great about this, you know, is it, is it started from a place that was so highly personal. And so you couldn't, you couldn't feel that way about these objects. You know, you had to understand these objects as objects that have lived. And like Jack said, that have a home in their frames. And, you know, that reality of them as objects moving through the world was not something that could be ignored. And it was something that I think each curator um, built upon. And so I just love that anecdote of the thermal stat that it's sort of like you know and I totally agree with you you know we are we always do struggle with that most of the time we try and hide it or you know um but I I love the fact that you know that's kind of what this show enabled it sort of allowed everyone to play those things up and have it not only be okay but be just great you know to say okay this thing is sitting here in this gallery next to this thermostat that's the reality. Let's acknowledge it. What do you make of this? You know, how does it change your experience or affect your experience? So yeah, I, I loved that about, it. I think I think everyone was doing that in their own way, each of the three. Can I just say something, um, which are, are two two observations. I'm sorry to cut into your time, Jared, but I mean- you Oh no, it. I'm done. Oh, thank Four's you. Good. Nice. Um, so uh, one is uh, that, each one of us chose not to uh, have labels on the walls, uh, which was a very um, conscious decision by all three of us, I believe. Uh, and um, the other thing is um, that the information is available. It's just that you want people that come into the exhibition to actually look at the drawings and not look at the labels that are next to the drawings. You, you literally want them to use their eyes to look at a drawing and to bring to that drawing their own experience. Um, there, you know, if, if you see, um, for instance, there's a, in Jared's show, there's a, a beautiful 1919 Picasso and it's very elegant and it's, of a, it's almost Ang-esque. I mean, he's, he's, he's channeling Ang. Uh, I'm sure he knew who Ang was. But, but six years before that, he's inventing cubism. And if you saw that drawing, and that was the first Picasso you saw in your life, you would have a different attitude when you saw the cubist works because you're bringing another information that you have to the drawings that you see. And it's true about all art. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying just drawings, but the idea that people are more interested in the date and who it is and, and and, and what I tended to find is that young people, maybe arbitrary date under 30, um, went through my exhibition and basically did photographs like on their, on their phones. And um, uh, I, was, I was amazed at what they were, what, what they were doing, um, uh, you know, what images they were taking. What, what, and it became a little game to, for me to see what they were actually interested in and interested enough to take a photograph of it. Uh, and not necessarily knowing who the artists were or maybe to look it up later. Um, uh, and I must say that each of the iterations had informations or sheets that you could go to and find out what 
the artist was, what the work was, what is the date. Um, when my show opened up, I had, it, I was like literally opened up at 12 o'clock. There were three people right there. They all had these sheets in, in, the, in the exhibition. And I went in and I took them out of their hands and I said, you get these after you looked at the show. <laughs> and um, they were a little surprised. And I said, I was, you know, it was my collection. And I said, the idea is the joy of looking, of, you know, the ways of seeing, how you see something and how you approach it. So um, I don't know if either one of you uh, have any ideas about no, no, no text or no uh, labels. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that we are all conscious of that. Well, uh, no, Arlene, go. First, first of all, it would have been a mess <laughs> to have to, to have labels uh, and everybody, I think, ever, any time I've been involved, like for instance, at the Frick, they never have labels. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes mistakes are made in identifying things, but that's almost okay. Yes, because uh, it brings into question what is the essential information that we are seeking. <laughs> and the essential information that we are seeking uh, does not necessarily start with his, the date and the name. Uh, it is always, I'm always interested to know that, but it does not need to be the first thing that I know. Uh, and I think that's what you're, you're getting at. And that's what we all are getting at in terms of how to, we're given parameters here. There's a given amount of space. How are we gonna use that space in the most effective way? And what are, what are we going to prioritize? And prioritizing the, you know, the date and the name are, uh, you know, was clearly not called for in this situation where there's such a rich richness and there's so many things. So, uh, I mean, I, in Jarrah's, I can't even imagine what the labels would have looked like on those dark walls that would have like done a turn with the thermostat. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's just much more beautiful, ethereal, and for me, inviting. You know, one of the things that brings to mind for me very quickly is almost like point of view or like personal style, where it's like we've all kind of been to someone's house and we've seen like the way everything in their house is like branded in a very particular way. Like the, their interior designer or their art consultant has been like, well, you need a this name and you need a that name and you need one of these. And it really doesn't show like any kind of, like something that used to be called like an eye or like a sense of like personal presence. And I think that that's one of the things that, that um, I think we all got permission from in Jack's collection was it really gave you that sense where it's like, this is someone who's responding to their own inner direction. And it's like, you know, you see people like wearing clothes where everything's like, this is Balenciaga and this is that, and this is that, it's all in quotation marks. And I think that in the, the drive away from the temporary reprieve from the label is exactly like the, the reprieve from the label in a kind of clothing sense too. That's like, okay, if you're not foregrounding the fact that what you're wearing is a uh, Isi Miyake jacket, then you might actually have to foreground the fact that you are a human being who is trying to function in the world in a particular way that isn't retreating behind that as almost the label as a shield. And so I think that this was kind of an experiment in almost like connoisseurship, even though that's like a naughty, naughty word. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why you would say that's a naughty word. And uh, Jared, I, com naughty word. I completely agree with you in that. And maybe this is a moment to clarify to everybody. I am not an art consultant or an art advisor in any way, shape or form. I don't know where that came from. And I think one of the great joys about seeing the show and why I wanted to be 
part of this conversation is that it just encourages curiosity and elicits these questions of um, what am I interested in? What are these things that I have a personal interest in? There's such a personal view of Jack's and in each of you that is so special. Um, and I think just uh, one of the most, you know, I think this is why the Drawing Center is one of my favorite exhibition venues because I can't think, it's hard for me to think of one other venue that could do a show like this and hold it. So, I mean, Claire, I mean, you are the person who is in, in putting together these amazing shows. I can't think of another place that really uh, has the, and I, I use the word institution in the best sense, that it's got the history and a, a longstanding um, uh, reputation of having these impactful moments and, and exhibitions like these. So um, before we forward, you know, send it on to questions. One, one more thing. Just yes, I was going to say, is there anything else? And Joachim, I mean, do you agree that this is a show that would be very rare to find in, in museums anywhere? Mesmerizing in so many, so many ways. Thank you, Helen. Thank you all. And I just, I saw a question that has been addressed on the chat box and I, which I had myself. And I may, I may turn to Jared, if you don't mind, to, to just quickly ask this particular question. I mean, the, the, we could go on and on about the incredibly powerful, distinct individual curatorial voices that are being uh, iterated in each case. And uh, Arlene was talking, I was fascinated by the way she was describing her choice. And I'm coming to you, Jared, with the same question, her choice of the color by reflecting the time of the year, the time of the season, that sort of segues with what we're going to hear Steve, Steve Levine, I think, with his poetry, I believe. But anyway, Jared, in your case, your choice, your chromatic choices or non-chromatic, as in the case of Black, is very striking. Uh, would, can, you, can you take us, um, I know somebody was also asking about that, and could you take us through the decisions that led you to um, the final outcome? Well, I think that I couldn't really, I mean, I, I retroactively could intellectualize why I wanted to do it, but I yep. think that it occurred to me as like a vision in my mind first. And actually uh, Claire knows that like just one day I like sat down with watercolors and I was like, here you go. This is what the thing should look like. The gallery should be painted in a gradient divided in half. Mm -hmm. And like, I had deep, like unconscious um, reasons for wanting to set up that structure, but it took me doing it to start coming to understand it. And so I, I would say it wasn't a premeditated um, thing other than um, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to play with the space and with chronology. And I mean, I think the way that exhibitions unfold are sequential, they're just not linear. Mm -hmm. and so then the question becomes, how do you set up a way of being moved around that space or being told things about looking that isn't um, like, well, you do this and then you do this or whatever. So that's kind of where the uh, gradient uh, came from. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Glorious show. I agree a hundred percent, Helen. I think we, and, and I also agree with whoever told us that we should uh, actually go there. I well, think nothing, nothing like seeing it in the flesh. Almost two weeks more, uh, mm. nearly two weeks left to see the show till February 20th. So you can experience Jarrett's show um, at the moment, which I agree that the just so many things are just uh, resonate in my mind of all three of the shows. And um, Jack, like I said, I am, uh, we're all part of your fan club, but I feel like I now understand why I'm such a leader in, in the fan club mm -hmm. of you at personally. Um, getting acquainted with uh, the collection has let me understand why I, we all love you so much. So, so the, the, thing I, the thing, excuse me, the thing I was about to say was uh, I did do a show um, with Annie Philbin called um, Drawn from Artist Collections back in 1999 at the Drawing Center. And uh, if I think about it, it, it is sort of a forerunner to, to this uh, exhibition in a, lo a lot of ways. Um, I was at dinner with uh, Annie uh, up at Harvard and I had just seen two shows. Um, one was Vega as Collector and the other was um, 
Michael Craig Martin had done a show in, uh, in London called Drawing the Line. I think it was called Drawing the Line. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, and I said, you know, I, I know the collections of, of uh, you know, what, I know what Ellsworth has, what kind of drawings he has. I know what drawings uh, Roy had, Roy and Dorothy Lichtenstein, and I know uh, Jasper's collection. Uh, it would be great to see what artists, contemporary artists, literally live with and collect and what kind of drawings that they're drawn to. And the eccentricity, eccentricities of each of the collections were astonishing. I mean, they, they uh, you know, we, we, we work with each of the artists to create a group that they liked or that they were comfortable with. Um, and so in, in a lot of ways, that has been percolating in, in my mind since, since 1999. And it, and it was these kind of constellations. They weren't put together like I did, but they were basically these, these works that were put together by each of these. I think there were 15, 15 artists maybe in the, in the, in the uh, exhibition at that time. And uh, if I come to think of it, I think it has a lot to do with what's on the walls right now. So. That's really thank, thank, thank you, Drawing Center. <laughs> um, Taj, do we have questions that we would like to uh, have people ask now? If not, I have some myself, but I'd love to hear from people in the audience who've seen the show. Yes, we, we definitely have questions. Um, I want to thank all of you so much for such an expansive conversation today. I really appreciate you each delving into your takes. Um, we're actually going to go first to our own Fong Bui to open up the conversation. Fong, you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. What a, what a beautiful show. Uh, amazing conversation, you all. Thank you so much. I've seen all three versions, and I thought it was so original in different curatorial visions you all have. And I love the idea. I know that Eileen and Jared um, are both admirers of our mutual friend, um, Peter Lilbo Wilson, who also wrote under the pen name, Hakim Bay. Uh, his classic book, 1992, Temporary Autonomous Zone. How do you activate the short-lived space, the space in between? And each of you have done that independently. I thought it was fantastic. And in regard to I been talking about rhythm and you owed it to some extent, I can't help but to think of, of, of Jack's version B and Bebop with Charlie Parker and then maybe Eileen with Sunra, you know, <laughs> and then Jared could be equivalent to Philip Glass, thoughtful repetition maybe. But uh, in regard to free up label, I must say I had a a cousin who went to Amsterdam in the early 90s, and he was so excited, calling me from the hotel, and he said, Fong, I discovered two of my favorite artists of all time. One name is Rembrandt, the other name is Van Rai. <laughs> <laughs> so it can be confusing at times. Anyway, this is, a, this is a question I have for you, Jack. Uh, number one, I love your photography. I don't know, you guys know Jax being a photographer. Amazing black and white photography has been making forever. The portrait of John Jono, I have a, a, a copy of it. Williamsboro and other people also. Beautiful photo that Jack had taken also um, of Ellsworth studio. It's super moving. Uh, let me ask you this, if you grew up in um, LA and you were familiar with Pasadena art, would you ever uh, aware of maybe perhaps Matt, one of our great curator, Walter Hart, because he was there. At sure, the sure, sure, of course. Cool, so you get to know Walter? Well, you know, I was young at that point. I mean, uh, I was, uh, I spent my time going into La Cienica for the Monday night art walks. I would go to all of the museums uh, in, in, in Los Angeles. Um, the, uh, you know, I mean, I remember really experiencing very early art and technology that was at LA County Art Museum mm -hmm. uh, that 
put together a number of artists that were working. Um, they embedded artists with um, uh, technological advances, some, some not, some, you know, some, whatever the artist wanted. They had a group of, of, uh, of uh, businesses that said, we will, you know, we would like to be part of this situation, as part of this experiment. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I must have been, oof, I don't know, not, not too old, but I, it, it blew me away. Uh, I, I remember, I mean, this is just a silly antidote, but uh, basically um, when I got my driver's license, my parents said I couldn't go on the freeway without one of them. Instead, I took my two brothers, my two younger brothers, and drove them through Malibu Canyon to go see the Getty before the villa was there. There, there was a house that housed uh, basically the, um, uh, the furniture and, and the, uh, uh, you know, basically it was decorative arts that were in the house. And here I was, you know, 17 with my, you know, 14 year old brother and my 11 year old brother going and seeing, like people were, you know, astonished by that. So it was, uh, it's always been in my blood. And I, I, I just have always tried to just use my eyes. I mean, that's, you know, that's what photography is about. Mm -hmm. um, Ellsworth um, to me was a, a great, you know, you turn off your mind and you start seeing things abstractly. Yeah. Uh, and um, I love Jared's answer about the walls and that how it just, it happened and, and, and all of a sudden things happen in your life and you can intellectualize them after the fact, but sometimes you just need to go with the spirit or, or, or just the experimentation or the play and you just move forward through that and just um, embrace it. Yeah, no, that's, that's how I think it too. My, um, my grandmother once say, if you live in a long tube, be thin. If you live in a barrel, be round. That's my curatorial philosophy, and I think Jared knows it too. <laughs> Excellent, you guys. I'm I sorry. wanted to, I just want to acknowledge Fong Bui as one of the wall color icons of <laughs> curatorial practice. Have you <laughs> ever seen a Bui show that wasn't lit with wall color? So I, I uh, just wanted to point that out. Hooray, Jared. Hooray. So listen, you guys, congratulations. Please go to see the show. I'm gonna zoom out to a meeting, but I love the three curatorials, you know, exercise, beautifully installed, thoughtful, and the collection itself is to die for. It's just so terrific. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Aline. And uh, thank you, Claire, and uh, Helen, and Joachim, and all of you guys here. Uh, to be continued. I see you super, super soon. Ciao, grazie. Thank you, Fong. Uh, and yes, we'll all we'll all run off to see the show as soon as possible. But first, we have more questions. Um, so uh, we're going to go next to a question from GE Schwartz. GE, you know the drill. Thank you very much, Ty. Yes. Um, Panel-wide question. Um, it seemed as though there's like often two ways of seeing with the body and then with the soul. Um, and again, I'm a layman, so I'm coming from that point of view. Um, is one of the aims of the show that, you know, often as the body sight might, might forget later on with time or decay, that the soul will remember forever. And it seems as though subtracting the text and the labels helps really do that. Jared, I think that's for you. Oh, well, I think that you have a really beautiful idea. You know, I don't think that's a question. I think it's a very um, elegant statement. And thank you for that. I agree. I, there's nothing I can add. I mean, it, 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 it really does have a certain sense of what was going on in that room in all three iterations. Yeah, I think I would also add just bringing in people from different walks of life and I mean I think everyone brought the body into it but it was definitely something I I had in mind when it inviting Arlene also someone who you know is is working very much with um the body in her own sculpture so I think she kind of physically brought I mean actually actually literally brought it in physically with the benches I think um 
Jared and Jack, I, I mean, the body is also everywhere present, um, you know, in the, in the drawings and in the way they arrange the, the drawings. Um, so there's different experiences of the body that are happening for sure in each of the hangs. Thank you. Thank so you much. very much. Thank you, GE. Um, she is always, always with really lovely questions. Um, uh, now I actually, I have a question, if I hope that's okay, um, which is that while I was listening to the three of you and, and uh, looking through all of the images, mm -hmm. I was thinking a lot about how you all seem to have um, different takes on the role of the viewer. And Jack, you were talking about, you know, stealing the, the exhibition checklist from from viewers and and Jared with the with the wall colors and how you were discussing the the labels um I was wondering if each of you could expand a little bit on your idea of like where the the three the three people present in any gallery come in so we you know the curator the artist and the viewer I know that's a broad question I hope that's all right <laughs> Jack, I see you <laughs> pantomiming. <laughs> well, I, I was actually struck by how each of the curators were also artists in their ways and um, also uh, had um, multidisciplinary perspectives. They weren't purely there as uh, what we would call as well, what we discussed before as the authority um, at, or the single view. Uh, so their roles were, they had multi, I feel like they were looking at things from multi roles and perspectives of, of experience and just be having experiential moments with the collection. Well, I, I feel like I'm always a viewer. Um, so, so that's, to me, the most important of that triumvirate of, of, of those three things you talked about. Um, and I, I tend, I mean, this is how I look at exhibitions, especially large exhibitions, is I will go through very quickly. And then uh, the other thing I do is go backwards because you can learn a lot about an exhibition by what you are being told, you are led through an exhibition most of the time. And um, when you walk backwards, you are seeing works 180 degrees differently than they were presented. You know, when you walk into a room, you're seeing that object across the room from you. When you walk through the opposite way, you're not looking at that particular work, you're looking at the one that was on your right as you walk through the door. And I tend to do that with big exhibitions because I, I really just want to see what, what somebody's trying to tell me and what I want to see. And then I think I uh, go back to like two or three works and, and spend time with two or three works. So, and, and that's how I see myself as a viewer. And that's how I saw myself, even with Arlene and Jared's iterations, I was looking at things that I hadn't seen before, which was amazing. I mean, like, I, it was a revelation to me, uh, some, some of the drawings that they had up, and, and, and all of a sudden I was looking at them differently. And, um, and that, was, that was the powerful part about having two other incredibly amazing people, thank you both, um, join me in this adventure. I, I think that the answer is that we were asked to do it. So there wasn't a mandate to separate our different, our roles that, that, that we were all three, that, that we were all three. And that was the, that was the joy of it actually. Um, and, and I would add the layer of respect also respect to the collection, respect to the institution and respect to the viewers, you know, uh, who were coming into that space. Uh, so 
I think we, you know, I, I don't, I don't know that uh, we would have accepted the invitation otherwise. Well, also, can I just say one other thing? Sorry. Uh, basically, I want kudos. Each one of us, I'm sure, believe this uh, to the installation team at at the drawing center, which mm -hmm. are uh, incredible team. I mean, just. Yeah. Um, I mean, they worked with me. Uh, we 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 had a sense of play together, and it was and it was fun. And we would look at things, and they would talk about things, and and it it it, it really helped me in a lot of ways. Uh, I think that when you have a team that is so knowledgeable about art, and are most of them were artists themselves, uh, and and they saw the the fun that we were having, um, they saw what we were doing. And um, so a kudos out to everybody, but, but the installation uh, group was amazing. So. I mean, I loved when you speak about how much fun you had. Yeah. And even though it's clear you bring your artistic sensibility to your curation, how it brought you out of this category or this idea of being just an artist, or that's not, I didn't phrase that correctly, but just as that, that's fine with me. <laughs> I be an artist with many other dimensions other than just than putting on a show or having you know working mm -hmm. on specific works of art that it took you out of your usual uh, sensibilities and mm -hmm. identity almost well, well I think I think we all do things to learn so and and to break break the rhythm of doing what we already know. So I have to trick myself in the studio with various methods of making in order not, in order to get out of doing repetitive stuff uh, and doing these projects in the world, which seem to require a different set of sensibilities and information and intellect but actually are actually such feeders such rich uh rooting uh material that i can then bring back to the studio and vice versa so i don't see any of it's sort of like the mind body dichotomy that people want to set up no it's it's all one thing you know it's 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 we it's it's a holistic experience and we bring everything that we can summon at every moment to everything. And that's that's what I personally want to do always. And I feel like that's what we all were asked to do. Um, but with Claire and the Drawing Center and Jack's very generous uh, invitation. And you know, if if we succeeded, I'm thrilled. Well, I think you definitely all succeeded. And I think the word generosity is really the sort of the key word about um, putting together these shows. And Jack, your generosity and sharing your collection with everyone. Um, Ty, is there we more? Have, Should we move to the poetry as time moves on? Yeah, we, we have uh, our final question is going to come from Andrew Woolbright. Andrew, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, can you hear me? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, really wonderful shows in curation. And I, you know, love Burger and thinking of the way you all did such wonderful justice. I put in the chat earlier, but I kept thinking of his essay on Montaigne and him and his daughter laying to try to get the foreshortening of the, the Christ in their bodies, like laying in the museum. Um, all that being said, uh, did, did any of you come across an ideology that you weren't aware of when you were hanging? Like there's this fun playfulness and perversity and enjoyment because you're all artists and realizing names and, and trying to present some type of objective curation is pointless. Um, was there a purity that you felt as you were hanging the work or an ideology that you realized you do have that a sensibility that came across from experiencing through the bodies? 
that surprised me. Maybe that's it. I, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by ideology. Um, uh, and I don't think there was one for me. I, I think it's purely visual on my part. Uh, it's, it's, uh, um, I, 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 do, I do concentrate on the figure, uh, 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 probably 70% of the collection is figured, maybe 65%, 70% and the other tends to be uh, abstract. Uh, and I try to get that across in my, uh, my installation of, of the work. Um, the whole back wall of the small gallery was um, abstraction, black and white abstraction primarily. And, um, but uh, being a photographer uh, and I deal with the, the figure in terms of portraits and uh, uh, nudes, uh, so that's something that, that I'm drawn to, um, you know, the freedom to, as, as an artist, to create whole worlds uh, with a figure is amazing. Uh, so that's, that's one of the joys. Um, uh, you know, I'm always looking for photographs I've never seen. I mean, that's the kind of photography I try to create. Um, and uh, it's, it's hard. <laughs> Just like it's hard to create art that hasn't, you know, that is, you know, and you just have to do it. You have to do it for yourself and, and whatever, however it, it, it materializes in the future or in your life is, um, is just what, what art is about. So that's, that's how I see it. Sorry, if I didn't answer the question, I don't know. Well, that was wonderful, thank you. No, I'm sure, sure Jared could answer that question. I think it's something that you can't know because you're inside of and you only recognize through comparison and negation. So it's like you look at something, you're like, well, I would never do that. And I think that that's kind of the, the part of the dynamic that's set up between these three shows is you can actually refine your own sensibility or your own desires or what is useful to you by these three different perspectives. You're like, well, I really like how someone did this, but I don't like that they did that and, and vice versa. You know, I don't think that if, if it already existed in the world the way that you wanted it, then you wouldn't have to make anything. So, yeah. But it's an impossible question that you asked. Andrew. <laughs> but an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, I'll pass on that. <laughs> we love impossible questions here at the Rail. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew. And uh, thank you again, Jared and Jack and Arlene for answering all these questions. Um, and now I'm so excited because here at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending all of our community events with a poetry reading. And today I am more than thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Steve Levine to the stage. Steve Levine is a poet and a navigator of the space-time continuum. His writing is primarily collected in a blue tongue, three numbers and pure notations from the toothpaste press and The Cycles of Heaven and Two and Four from Coffeehouse Press, as well as various magazines and anthologies. Steve, please take it away. Hi. I am um, really pleased to be participating in this event. I saw all three iterations of the show at the Drawing Center, and I thought they were exceptional and revelatory. So, that said, um, what I'd like to do is read uh, four poems that were published in the December, January edition of The Rail and one additional poem. Two takes, one, position paper. Where I live is not my home. I am my home, a bright still speck by the raging creek sometimes sputtering as I speak, confusing certainty with a lack of humility. When not asleep, I always think to confound expectations, search the world for its flaws, sort the contrary torrent. I imagine I am the wet breath of the forest, summoning the rain, 
but I know I am really a grudging spring, unblinkingly yearning. Two, fortune cookie. The unyielding tree is snapped by the rushing stream. The flexible reed conforms to the current. Don't strive for perfection in this imperfect world. Take your medicine, not your medication. Embrace the unembraceable to grasp what is beyond your reach. Sip the illusory soup. Suck the inane nipple. Give voice to the ineffable. And don't take it personal as you hurtle toward the inevitable. Keep an eye out. Beware the naughty beauty, the intricacy of your personality. Beware a present bent to fit the past, a future of fruitless pursuit. Beware the onslaught of the orchestra whose discord doesn't cut it. A deep fake Eric Dolphy spurting faulty furtive spirits. Beware the sound of one hand clapping, which is finally just a slap. Listen, the world is clever, but never clear. It refuses to be your polished mirror you have to admit it's terrifyingly blurry now, when normally it's merely a terrible blur of the things you're pleased to have forgotten and those you've never known. Reconsider, baby. Here it is again, time to take refuge in the blues, to wrest meaning from the wreckage and re-wreck it. The out of your hands, not in your pocket, this quiet time, when everything is only temporary, at best a crapshoot, uncertain in its entirety. My thoughts like fingers passing back and forth restlessly across the embossed cover of your stark white book. Lily of the Incas. Funny how the speckled white and pink petals born in the umbels of the Alstromeria bought to adorn our dinner opened fully only the following day. And how even now a complete week later, a few of the same dead stems, though trimmed, linger, looking for all the world as if they are still living. From the shadows. As long as we insist on breathing, there is no escaping. Life shaped by longing and loss. With no darkness or irony, their shadows precede them. Without intentionality, they empty the beauty of night blooming flowers, hike through the muck while holding out and holding on. Move us to utter our desires as often as there are days. Maybe you know by now, I spend a lot of time with the language of fragility and mortality, of moments swallowed up and pulled forward toward chaos. Do you think that's too heavy? Do you think I should make it funny? Or do you want me to continue messaging from the margins, smoothing the convoluted loops for you? Thanks. Thank you so much, Steve. I was, uh, it took me a moment. I was trying to type, do you think that's too heavy? Should I make it funny into the chat? I was really excited about that one. Oh, um, me too, me too. <laughs> the questions we always has, must ask ourselves. Um, and thank you again, Jack and Arlene and Jarrett and Claire and Helen and Joachim. Uh, we'd also like to thank Emily from Arlene Studio and Isabella and the extended team at the Drawing Center for doing so much work to make today possible. 
Um, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, begrudgingly as we might say, uh, where we will upload today's conversation shortly. Um, and we at The Rail do this every day. So please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for our radical poetry reading with Jim Moore, featuring poetry read by Kamiko Han, Lawrence Joseph, Marilyn Nelson, and Spencer Reese. And now you may all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brooklyn Rail staff and everyone who helped contribute and especially to Claire, Jack, Arlene, and Jarrett. Jarrett, thank you for the wonderful- Thank you. Thank, thank you, Helen. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Thank you, Arlene. Thank you, John. Uh, well, I just want, I, I, there's somebody that we haven't mentioned is Laura Hoffman and uh, I wanna send her my love. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Arlene. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Claire. Do you continue, Steve and Louine. <laughs> I, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you all. Congratulations. Thank you. Lovely rest Thank of your you. day. Go see the show. <laughs> we'll run. And thank you, Helen. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.